Well, hi, friends. Welcome to worship for Sunday, September 6th, the year 2020. My name is Pastor Jack Keating, and I am the pastor here at Emmanuel United Methodist Church in Camillus, New York, and we are glad that you have joined us for worship today. Today we're celebrating the 14th Sunday after Pentecost, and our scripture reading today that I'm going to be speaking about comes from the 13th chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. This is where Paul discusses with the Roman church about how loving our neighbor really is the fulfillment of God's law. And my message is entitled, The Armor of Light. During this service, you'll hear a great children's time with Ashley. You will uh, have the chance to hear some wonderful special music with a guest artist we have today. And uh, we're also going to celebrate the Sacrament of Holy Communion as well during this worship service. So maybe you'll want to pause for a second to get your communion service ready so that you have uh, some juice and a piece of bread or a cracker available to you so that when that time comes for communion, you can celebrate right along with us at home or wherever it is that you're watching our service today. All right, we're going to begin our worship service this morning by singing with Dan and Lisa. And uh, we have been here at church humming along with the hymns when we're in person to save uh, on the uh, potential spread of the coronavirus. But when we are uh, gathered virtually, we can just sing right at the top of our lungs. So friends, sing along as we warm up our hearts and our voices and prepare to worship. As we gather here in your name, O Christ, you are already among us. Keep us open to your presence in us and around us that we may grow closer to you. Let us pray. You who have created us and who sustains us, we come with thanksgiving for these moments when we can ease the pace of our lives and listen for your voice. Create a spirit within us 
that truly draws us toward you and toward our brothers and sisters. A spirit deep, perceptive, gentle, and bold. Clear our minds, open our hearts, and touch us with your presence and your power. We offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our friend and our Savior. Amen. Will you join your heart with mine in this prayer of confession and forgiveness? Let us confess our sins against God and against each other. Merciful God, we know that you love us and that you call us to fullness of life. But around us and within us, we see the brokenness of the world and of our own ways. Our successes leave us empty and our progress does not satisfy. Our prosperous land is, is not the promised land of our longing. Forgive our willful neglect of your word our insensitivity to the needs of others, and our failure to feed the spirit that is within us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Remember that Jesus looked up and said to that sinner, Where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? Then neither do I condemn you. Go, and do not sin again. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our first scripture reading today comes from the book of Romans, chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. Love for the day is near. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow person has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, close yourself, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Our next scripture reading comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. A brother who sins against you. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen... Take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you the truth. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you. For my Father in heaven, by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
Good morning. Today, I'm going to tell you a little story. Once upon a time, there were two brothers. Their father had a large farm, and when he became too old to work, he called to his sons, and he said, I am too old to work anymore. I will divide my farm in half and give each of you half. I know that you always work together and will be good friends. When the brothers started farming on their adjoining farms, they were the best of friends who would share everything together. Then one day there was an argument between the two brothers and they stopped speaking to one another. For many years, not a word was spoken between them. One day, one of the brothers at his, was at his house when a carpenter came to the door and said, I would like to do some work. Do you have any work I could do? And the brother thought for a moment and replied, I would like for you to build a fence on my property. Build it now, build it down near the stream that separates my farm from my brother's. I don't want to see my brother anymore, and I would like for you to build a high fence there, please. I'm going into town, and I will be back this evening. When he came back that evening, he was shocked to see that the carpenter had not followed his instructions. Instead of building a high fence like he wanted, he had built a bridge over the stream. The man walked down to take a look at the bridge, and as he did, his brother walked towards him from the other side. His brother said, After all of the terrible things I've done to you over the years, I can't believe that you would build a bridge and welcome me back. He reached out to his brother and gave him a big hug. The brother then walked back to his farmhouse to talk to the carpenter. Can you stay? he asked. I have more work for you to do. The carpenter answered, I'm sorry, but I cannot stay. I have to go, for I have many other bridges to build. Sometimes you and I may have disagreements with our brothers and sisters in Christ. When that happens, we often build a fence between ourselves and them. We stop talking to them. We don't want to see them. We don't want to be around them. But this isn't what Jesus wants us to do. Instead of fences, he wants us to build a bridge and love between us. Let's pray. Dear Father, we know that it is your desire for us to live together in peace and harmony. Help us to love one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you join your heart with mine in prayer? Oh God, we want so badly to follow you. We want to be and to do all that you have created us to be and do. So guide, O oh Lord, the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts at this time and forever. Amen. So friends, here again this text that comes from Romans 13, this time in the contemporary English version of the Bible. You know what sort of times we live in, Paul writes, and so you should live properly. It is time to wake up. You know that the day when we will be saved is even nearer now than when we first put our faith in the Lord. Night is almost over and day will soon appear. We must stop behaving as people do in the dark and be ready to live in the light. Live properly. Be ready to live in the light. You know, I want to start today by sharing something with you that I clipped a few years ago from one of our denominational publications. The author writes under the headline, Holier, Happier, Healthier, these words. Attending church regularly is not only good for your soul, it's also good for the rest of you, according to Time magazine. In a recent cover story, 
about changing attitudes to help, the magazine cited several specific studies which indicated that people who are religious are markedly healthier than those who are not. Their blood pressure is lower. They have fewer heart problems. They're less prone to depression. They even recover faster and more completely from hip fractures. Now, I think that's pretty cool. It is something that I, I think we should all think about, especially those of us who are not quite so regular in our worship of God, or those of us who might be sitting home right now thinking, it's time to give up on church altogether. It is the stuff of biblical promise, which has always said that if we follow God, if we obey God and obey the Lord's commands, that we will prosper. And I want to share with you, as far back as Moses, these words that Moses spoke just before his death, as recorded in Deuteronomy 28. Always obey the laws, Moses says, and the teachings of the Lord. And the Lord will make your businesses and your farms to be successful. The Lord will make you his own special people. He will make you successful in your daily work. He will open the storehouses of the skies where he keeps the rain. And he will send rain on your land at just the right time. He will make you a leader among the nations and not a follower. Fast forward a few thousand years to Jesus and his Sermon on the Mount when he's speaking about anxiety and about worry about what to wear and what to eat, how to get by. And he says these words that have now been put into a hymn in our United Methodist hymnal. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Allelu, alleluia. Alleluia indeed. Of course, there's there's not a strict relationship between faith, between attending church regularly, between keeping the commands of God and worldly success, because the cross reminds us of that. The book of Job tells us that the spirit in our hearts will tell us that. But all in all, being with God, being in the family of God, and acting out or living out your faith in a community, in a church, in worship with one another is one of the best things that you can do in worldly terms as well as spiritual. But even as I say this, let me remind you that around the world today, pastors and missionaries and people who gather for the worship of God are killed simply because of the gospel they believe in, because of the name that they bear. Faith is not simply about attending church and prospering because of it. No, it's about commitment. It's about belief. It's about courage, about passion, about love. Love even when you don't want to love. Love even when your brother or your sister hurts you. Love even when it takes you to the cross, not to that new Cadillac. Nevertheless, I marvel, my friends, and maybe you should too. I marvel at how so many people who do not believe miss what seems to be so obvious to those who do believe, that God's promises are sure, 
and that the faithful are rewarded in this world by what Jesus calls in the 10th verse of the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, abundant life. Life in its fullest. And in the next, by what we call eternal life. But the abundant life is not a life of worldly riches. Rather, it's a life that's often full of spiritual treasures. A long life which commences now and continues were promised forever. Think about it long and hard, my friends, because statistics suggest, and even the honest scientist cannot rule out the idea that the claims of our faith are true, that loving God and obeying God's commands, that attending church regularly and living properly that living in the light has real benefits. So what does it mean to live in the light? Well, Paul suggests it means several things. Some of them are really pretty pedestrian, very simple, very common sense, much like the uh, advice that good mothers and good fathers have told their children for generations. Don't go to wild parties or get drunk, or be vulgar, or indecent. Don't be quarrelsome, don't be jealous. There's pretty obvious benefits to those things, aren't there? You don't have a bad reputation. You never have to worry about a hangover. There's no having done things that you might regret if you could only remember what it was that you did. There's nobody looking at you because of your vile mouth or avoiding you because of your inappropriate acts. There's, there's no senseless feuds that are brought about by insisting that your point is right and somebody else's is wrong. There isn't that little green tinge around the gills as you fume about how somebody else managed to get more than you have. There's no more pain in your gut as you think about how little you have. It's pretty obvious stuff with pretty obvious benefits. But you know this living in the light, if you're going to do it properly, there's a little bit more about it than what seems obvious. And that's why Paul goes on in verse 14 to say, let the Lord Jesus Christ be as near to you as the clothes that you wear then you won't try to satisfy your own selfish desires. You see, to live properly, to really live in the light, is to do more than, than simply follow a bunch of rules. It's more than the legalism of the Pharisees and the scribes or the unyielding approach to things that the rapidly orthodox and politically correct folks would try to have us believe to live properly, to live in the light, is to be close to the one who is the light, to be in intimate communion with, to be in touch with the one who vanquishes the darkness in the first place. It is to put on, to, to wear, as it were, to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the one who made heavens and earth who knows from his very own experience our every weakness. And my friends, it is above all, I think, a matter of attitude, a matter of desire, a matter of the spirit which is inside of us. You see, the Christian life isn't a matter of rules and regulations. It's a matter of wanting to be like the Lord Jesus, and of believing in him and of following him, of living by the love that he showed us when he went to that cross and died for us. Today we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And that's what the Lord's Supper is all about. That's what the kingdom of God is really all about. Living in the light is a marvelous thing, my friends. 
but it also has a deep and serious side too because the light asks us and shows us that we owe to one another the kind of love that God has for each of us. It calls us to take that solemn pledge, that solemn obligation, that solemn debt, a debt of gratitude and thanksgiving. And that means, my friends, that we must be willing in our relationships with one another to go first, to be the first to reach out after the quarrel, to be the first to try to work things out after we have been sinned against, to be the first when things can't be worked out, and even when they can, to trust God for the results to be first in seeking reconciliation, and the first to refuse to fret or to grow anxious or to be bitter or hateful because of what happens to us. Living in the light is a wondrous thing to do, but it's a difficult thing as well. Jesus promises that he is with us always, even to the close of the age. That's the promise of God for all of us. And all of those who walk in the light know that promise and rejoice in that promise. Praise be to God. Let us gather our hearts and our minds together now for a time of prayer. Let there be praise and joy in our hearts, O God. We have many suggestions about how things could be different and better. It could be cooler. There could be more rain. We could be less busy. We could have more vacation. We could have fewer bills to pay. The unfortunate we smart over the good we take for granted. Forgive us when we fret so much about the way things aren't that we forget to be thankful for remarkable blessings which are ours in the way things are. In these moments, we will remember enough to let there be praise and joy in our hearts. Call to our mind the joy of a good stretch when we've slept soundly the exhilaration of a day when we don't have to follow a regular routine, the grace of a drink of cold water going down on a hot day. Review for us the pleasure in the song of the thrush, the sight of the hovering hummingbird's miraculous flight, the nervous chittering of the squirrels. Call to our mind the good feeling when we are comfortable with a loved one, the excitement when we look forward to being with friends or family, the richness of watching children grow and mature, the full heart experienced when a child says, I love you. The list is longer than we can finish. 
We have enough and more for there to be joy and praise in our hearts. Let it be, dear Lord. We do not desire to gloss over the pain and hurt which is a part of life. We know persons who are bowed down with heavy responsibilities, persons who are trying to gather the pieces of broken relationships, persons who wonder what it would be like to feel healthy again, persons who both accept and struggle against physical limitations. By your spirit, Lord, when any of us are confused or in pain, we are able to live in strength and courage if in faith we remember to ask for help. Let it be so for all who need you. Let some sense of blessing touch each one who joins in this prayer. And in return, you shall hear in our hearts a song of praise and joy. Through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will you join your heart with mine in prayer? We give you thanks, O God, through your beloved servant, Jesus Christ, he whom you sent to save us and redeem us, and be the messenger of your will. He is your word, inseparable from you, through whom you made all things, and in whom you take such great delight. We thank you for how, in fulfillment of your will, he stretched out his hands in suffering to release from suffering those who place their hope in you. In doing so, he won for you a holy people. We recall, O oh God, how of his own free choice, Jesus was handed over to his passion in order to make an end of death and to shatter the chains of the evil one to trample underfoot the powers of hell, and to lead the righteous into light, to establish the boundaries of death, and to manifest the resurrection. And so as we gather now in praise and thanksgiving at this time, we remember how on the night before his passion he took bread, and I hope you will take yours there as well, and gave you thanks, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you. We also recall how, in the same way, when the meal was over, he took the cup. And again, he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my blood which is shed for you. When you do this, do it in memory of me. O Lord, as we have been commanded, and remembering the death and the resurrection of your Son, we offer you this bread and this cup, thankful that you have counted us worthy to serve you. We entreat you to send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of your Holy Church to these gifts, making them for us communion in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Father, we pray that you will gather into one all of those who share in these sacred mysteries, fill them with your Holy Spirit and confirm their faith in the truth. And hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, these are the gifts of God given for the people of God. And so I invite you now to take your bread, to take a piece of that bread and to eat it as you remember Jesus, your Lord and your Savior.
and then take your cup. Give thanks to God and drink your cup again as you remember Christ, who loved you more than any other ever. Let us pray. For the bread that we have eaten, for the cup that we have tasted, for the life we have received, we thank you, O God. Grant that what we have done and what we have been here today may so put its mark upon us that it may always remain in our hearts. Grant that we might become more mature Christians, that ours might be the faith that brings issues into action through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, friends, we have some announcements for you today. Uh, we want to let you know that we're going to take tomorrow off from our normal coffee chat schedule. Monday, September 7th is the celebration of Labor Day. And so uh, we will take Monday off this week and resume our coffee chats next Monday, the 14th of September at 10 o'clock via Zoom. We're also getting ready for our new September book study. We're reading together the book White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo. And we're going to offer that on Monday evenings at 7 o'clock and Wednesday mornings at 10 o'clock. Those are identical sessions each week, and they will be conducted on Zoom. So if you'd like to join our book study, go out and purchase the book, begin reading the book. I think we're going to look at the first three chapters on that first week, and you'll want to send me an email to pastorjackk at gmail.com, and I'll shoot you back an email with the invitation in it, and then you can log right on to our Zoom meeting on either Monday night at 7 o'clock or Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock. We're going to be resuming in-person worship inside our church building on Sunday, the 13th of September. Uh, we'll resume worship at 8.30 a.m. and at 10 a.m., and uh, we're going to be following all the CDC and health department guidelines as we do so. Uh, check your inbox for information and uh, to what those guidelines are so that we make sure that we keep everyone as safe as possible. We want to uh, again remind you that our church website has a new donate button right on the front page. And there you can uh, make uh, a donation to the church. You'll find that when you click on that button, there's easy to follow instructions there. It's also a very secure website and a secure way for you to make a donation. We want to thank you for all of the gifts that you give that help Emmanuel do the ministry we do all around the world. My friends, will you receive today's words of benediction? Go in peace. Love and care for one another in the name of Jesus Christ. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you 
and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, now and forevermore. Amen.